So this is what I'm going to talk about. I've introduced it already. Robust details is, if you've not heard the term, it's about acoustics in the context of this particular presentation. Uh, robust details recently re relocated to Bletchley Park. We quite like it. It's the home of the co-breakers. And you can see on the right-hand side there, our customer <coughs> services team are all settled in well. They're, they're fine and happy with, uh, with what we're doing at the moment. And if you're ever passing, come in and see us. You can spend five minutes talking about robust details. And we go for a tour of the site and see Alan Turing's office and uh, much more interesting things going on there. Looking back then, it was back in January 2001 when the Part E of the building regulations was out for public consultation in England and Wales. Uh, a controversial proposal in that consultation package was the idea that, that house builders, and this was aimed particularly at new housing, should carry out pre-completion testing to show that they built properly, to show that the uh, party walls and floors they installed actually met the, the, the performance standards. This in the world of building control is quite contentious. There's almost no parallel for it. And uh, uh, I was actually at House Builders Federation at the time, and they kind of didn't want to do it because they said, well, it's going to be expensive. We'll have to pay for the testing. And if it all goes wrong, it's going to slow down house sales, completions. We're going to have to do remedials. And uh, if you think that was a negative uh, kind of set of thoughts to have, uh, the consultation document set out our house builders never got it right anyway. 40 to 50 percent of the times, you know, houses were being hand over, handed over, didn't meet the old party. So everybody thought this was going to be uh, going to be difficult. Um, and what the industry did was ask for an alternative approach. So instead of doing this pre-completion testing, can't we have something else? And they didn't say, can't we have robust details? We haven't designed it then. What they said is, can't we have a reliable pattern book? Can't we have checklists? Can't we have those kind of things rather than testing? And he eventually uh, uh, came forward as an idea um, that we presented to the minister. He quite liked it in, uh, in conceptual form. He said, well, I'll, I'll postpone this requirement for a year so that House, uh, you at the Housewives Federation can work up some proposals. I have to say, um, we, we found a, a, a very interesting and able partner in Edinburgh Napier University, who we gave a project management uh, contract to, having seen a few, to, to actually develop our idea, uh, our embryonic idea, into a set of... Uh, 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 proposals that, uh, that we thought could work. And we convinced the Minister, in the end he, uh, he approved the Robust Detail Scheme and since the middle of uh, uh, 2004, Robust Details has operated as an alternative to pre-completion testing for complying with part <coughs> of the, the building regulations. And not surprisingly, most people who build standard house forms use Robust Details rather than PCT. The scope of the scheme, it uh, clearly affects <coughs> because party only addresses this, uh, joined dwellings, uh, not detached houses, so it's new, new build, joined dwellings, um, uh, covered by the scheme. In England and Wales, um, party um, is the regulatory standard. Uh, fairly recently, we've applied the scheme to Scotland under, as you probably know, quite, quite different uh, regulations and standards. Uh, but the interesting thing about the scheme is, is it's, you know, well, we found it to be easily adaptable. Um, we, we lobbied uh, Scotland, Scotland quite liked what we, uh, what we had to say, and so you can use robust details in Scotland as well. And you need Northern Ireland, and um, my plan is to take over the world. If I can't use robust details for part L, I thought, well, you know, we've got Guernsey as well and the Isle of Man, so some, some, um, Denmark next, I think somebody here from Denmark, I'll be having a chat later on. But we quite like it, you know, it, it's a, uh, in a world of innovation, here we have a regulatory answer developed for England and Wales, which seems to be popular and may prove uh, you know, to be interesting elsewhere. So, probably belatedly, what do we mean by robust detail? Uh, it's two words which we've now got a uh, uh, registered trademark for, which was kind of interesting because the words robust and detail are pretty uh, commonly used. But we found out early days people would use the term casually and they say, well, don't worry, I'm using robust detail, so I won't have to test, or I'm using robust detail, so therefore it will meet part L and part B and everything else. So, so we brought this under control, really, and a robust detail, by building regulation definition, is a wall of floor design that's been assessed and approved by Robust Details Limited. And uh, here's an extract from our hard copy handbook. That's kind of what a, a bit of a Robust Detail looks like. Usually eight pages long, you know, it's a specification, a few sketches, uh, and a checklist at the end. To get this approval, uh, the, the, uh, the construction has to show itself as uh, being able to exceed building regulation performance standards. Uh, I'm not going too uh, uh, technically deep into this today, but we have a safety factor applied to Robust Details. Uh, we go for performance that's five decibels better than building regulations. If you can achieve that, um, you, you can be a robust detail uh, with our approval. You might say that's over-engineered and, uh, and that's an inefficient way of building because when you unpick it, it kind of is because these walls are bigger, denser, wider than they might need to be to, to pass building regs. Uh, but what the industry thought was they'd rather have that than pay for the tests. 
and very virtuously they said, well, we're passing the benefit to the homeowner because the quieter the wall is, the better it is for everybody. So this safety factor is a, is a kind of victimless, uh, victimless crime, I guess, in my estimation. Uh, we took from government that uh, robust detail has to be practical construct. These aren't specialist uh, things, and indeed you can see from the drawing, it's just the block wall. So it has to be practical to construct from site. Government said, can we make them workmanship proof? And I tell you, you can make nothing workmanship proof. So we say they're reasonably tolerant to uh, workmanship error. And uh, over time, they've shown themselves to be so. And what you get as a builder, as I emphasise, really, it's a passport through pre-completion testing. If you've registered to use robust details, then you don't need to carry out tests. And that, uh, that makes it fairly risk-free for the designer and builder. So from the designer's point of view, the, the, uh, I suppose the, the decisions are fairly easy, really. Is the building you're designing, can it use robust details? If you go to our handbook, you can, uh, you can see the, uh, the various patterns available there. There are 60 different patterns for robust details covering uh, most forms of construction. Uh, and within each pattern, there are variations of floor finishes, ceiling finishes, whatever, that, uh, that cover most common circumstances, because those, those are things we've, uh, we've tested. Once you've selected your, uh, your robust detail, the rest of your design should fit around it, you know, the width of the cavity, the density of the block work, the, uh, the plasterboard lining, what, whatever you've shown. So that, that's the basis for your separating walls and, uh, and floors. Once, uh, once that's been done, it's the responsibility of the builder to register each plot with, with us um, because that's how he gets his documentary evidence to show building control is using robust details. Um, we give it a, a unique document, uh, a unique reference. Uh, we, we give uh, uh, the builder all the documents he needs for the building control body as evidence that he's using the robust details route. And he has to do that before work starts. And then the, uh, the plots concerned are then covered by the robust details scheme. The builder undertakes under our terms and conditions to build in accordance with the specification. It seems obvious, but, but we, we have to hold him to that, and we do, uh, as you'll see later, inspections and tests to make sure they do that. Um, he has to, all the way along, satisfy building control that other requirements uh, of building regulations have been met. We, uh, we provide a service that, I always say, kind of complements the normal building control, building inspection, NSBC inspection procedures. Uh, we, 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 don't, um, uh, we don't trump them, we don't, we don't get uh, building control out of the way for party, we, we're all doing the job that, uh, that, that we're supposed to be doing anyway, and this is, uh, is complementary. And the interesting thing for the builder, um, and something <coughs> that came in for the first time really, the robust detail scheme, he's subject now to third party surveillance, that, that is uh, inspection and test by us, if randomly selected for that purpose, and that's uh, a key part of the scheme, is the uh, random selection of sites for, for testing, inspection, surveillance. Uh, we've been around, obviously, for, for 12 years now, and uh, it's all got a bit difficult. I said there's 60 patterns in the handbook. Each, um, each pattern's about eight pages long. We've got appendices and, and stuff, and, and actually, uh, we, we're just now phasing out hard copies entirely. You, you'd really want to use this uh, as an online resource, which uh, everybody's doing now. But more than just complying with building regulations, you might need code or eco homes credits, or, or actually you might not now, but it's, uh, this has driven business uh, for, for five or six years. Uh, and you might be designing uh, uh, you know, uh, a particular form of uh, a flat where you, you're looking for a wall and floors to use in combination. You haven't decided what kind of floor you're going to use. You can use a handbook to find out what kind of floors work well with the kind of walls you're selecting or, or vice versa. And this is all, uh, like I say, an online, uh, free online facility. If you register on www.robustdetails.com, you can freely access all of this and all the things I'm uh, going to tell you about today, really. Uh, so it's more than just meeting building regs. If you've got a client uh, standard to meet that's way beyond building regs, we can probably find a solution that will work for you. Here's an interesting one. Do you need to fill the cavity? And you would say, well, obviously you do nowadays because that's, uh, that's what the building regulations require. Interestingly, the sequence and, uh, and timing of building in England and Wales, we found uh, is such that we're seeing a lot of uh, builders still building without fill cavities. It, it's, uh, submissions made back in 2010 or before 2008 still being built out. Uh, says something about the, the lethargy of the building regulation system, I guess. But it was a contentious thing when people started filling cavities uh, that we previously approved as, uh, as clear of, of anything. Uh, we found it, it did affect our, our test results. Uh, I'll say more about that later, whether it was good or bad, but, but uh, a change in part L of the building regulations addressing energy had a knock-on effect for us, which needs sorting out. And I would just say, again, in short order, it has been sorted out. And there are loads of robust details now, either with full-fill cavity options or robust details that have just been designed for a, a full-fill situation. 
And just to explain, if you didn't know, fully filling cavity uh, gives you a, a, a capacity to use a zero uh, U-value for your party wall, and everybody wants to get zero because that makes the rest of the calculation uh, much easier, as I'm sure you're aware. And here's, um, here's the big thing, really. It's a shame I can't show you actual animations. I, I probably could have done if I'd have spoke to John about the technology available. I'm just going to show you some stills. When you go to look at our robust details online now, bottom left-hand corner is a click-through to see an animated build sequence showing how the key features of this robust detail can be put together. So, for instance, uh, ceiling around the edge of, of eye joists is shown in, in a way that's kind of obvious uh, to us, maybe, but uh, for, for a building operative or, or, or somebody on site, maybe who's got skills in other areas, some of these things are, you know, are shown so clearly in animation that, uh, that really a lot of our builders are taking these up as part of their, their training and induction programs. Or how to apply a scratch coat to, uh, you know, you parge the wall, how should you leave it? We've got like the invisible man there parging a, a, a wall, scratch coating it before he puts on his plasterboard. And again, it's a free resource, so if it helps you understand uh, you know, how you're going to put your buildings together, uh, you know, once you've chosen your robust details, have a look at the animations. Shows you detailed things like saw pipe penetrations. I mean, it's great. It's better than me standing here, John. I should just have done it, really. Yeah. So that's uh, <coughs> that's all going quite well. The most interesting thing about our scheme, really, is is our surveillance. Really, we do a lot of uh, spot check, visual inspections, and sound tests. Uh, uh, people visiting the site don't have enforcement powers. That's all uh, all down the building control. If you find anything seriously wrong, we have to notify the building control body, and Building control bodies are, are quite comfortable with this now. Real power we have is to withdraw any pattern that doesn't um, doesn't shape up really. If we find a robust detail doesn't meet the standards we've applied to it, and we've had two of these in our history, we remove them from the pattern book. And where that's a big power, it really affects the supply chain. You know, the uh, uh, if, we, if we alert a particular um, uh, insulation supplier to the fact that something going wrong, we're measuring something wrong on site, it quickly intervenes and, and helps us sort it out in, in our limited experience. We have in our lifetime taken uh, over 12,500 tests on, uh, on completed, actual real completed homes, in, uh, mostly in England and Wales. Uh, it's a representative sample. We've got committees looking at how we sample and, and what we do. And we also um, do a further suite of uh, visual checks to see work in progress to see if we can um, find things that builders are regularly doing wrong, things they're struggling with, and, and take from that into our feedback loop ways of improving uh, our robust details. So here's, uh, here's some uh, trends and interesting findings, really. One of the things uh, we've always found with, uh, with masonry walls is uh, problems with wrong wall ties, mortar snots, things in cavities that shouldn't be there. And what these things do, they, they, they tie the two leaves together in an acoustically uh, bad way. They're rigidly tied and sound can pass from one side to another. Uh, so we were pleased to see the, the general wide introduction of insulation like this because it stops mortar snots dropping down the cavity. What a... What a Great thing that uh, that should have been for us, should have been. Because we've got uh, some new problems now, which is mortar slots on top of cavity bats. And it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But it, this is the world of construction. Uh, we had some inspectors when they joined us said, we'll, we'll sort that out, we'll make sure you, you, we never see mortar in cavities. Well, we always will. And we, we just need to be empirical about it and work our way around it. Here's a screen finished floor. The, the technology behind this is quite complex. I'm going to go quite quickly because John's uh, flashed a five minute warning at me. Um, that, that section is a typical uh, uh, floor with a, a screen that's uh, isolated from the structure by a blue, uh, shown in blue there, uh, resilient layer. If you don't put that resilient layer in, or if you don't dress it up and turn it around properly, you get a rigid bridge between all sorts of components, and sound can pass from one, uh, uh, one flat to another. So one of the things we will sometimes find, and it's one of our uh, probably bigger problems really, is this hasn't been done properly, and, and there is uh, all sorts of uh, hard bridges between the flat above and the, and the floor below. Uh, and in this case, for instance, taking the skirtings off, first of all, reveal the problem, so that, that this, uh, this, this blue resilient layer hasn't been tucked under the way it should have been done. It, it's been kind of left, often it's cut off by a, a plaster, ignorant of uh, what its purpose is. Uh, and so we, we, uh, by Carrying out investigations, we find out what went wrong. And the graph, again, won't, won't mean much, but imagine just taking those skirting boards off. What it did was improve the performance of that floor by seven decibels, because that skirting board had uh, made hard contact with the screed, caused a bridge, which took a sound um, down to the flat below. And, uh, you know, almost amazingly, from my background in buildings, I thought, I can't make that much difference. It makes a whole load of difference. 
and it's really informing builders, uh, site operatives, that some of these you know, components of the detail are kind of really important. So carrying that theme on, really, we've got a whole set of data, as you might imagine, from all those tests. So here's a, here's a graph of performance of a typical floating screen floor. It looks mostly good, uh, because uh, you probably pick out from the red dotted line, vertical line there, only the ones to the right of that are building reg fails. But our promise to government is we wouldn't have a fail rate in excess of 5% for any robust detail. And this one was a uh, borderline at best. Actually, it was, it was over the limit. What we've done um, is improve that, not by doing, a, a, and this element of innovation, we didn't invent anything for this. Uh, we've just engaged the supplier in uh, all sorts of things. He does toolbox talks, he provides training kits, he supplies the right amount of material with instructions printed on it on how to use it. And uh, those fairly simple interventions brought quite an improvement. So, uh, and the next uh, suite of measurements we made on the same floor uh, showed no failures in the red zone, just through supplier kind of care and uh, involvement really in design. More typical uh, feedback and improvement thing is when we produce a leaflet or brochure, we used to do this all the time, we'd find something wrong. Here's a, a radon uh, barrier or gas barrier uh, provided. Uh, a pretty harmless thing, a rubbery kind of material which won't link the, the leaves together in any kind of rigid way unless you drop four inches of mortar on it, which is what people did. So we, we started telling people, think about where you're going to put this, think about what you might do about it. And even as a, almost, uh, uh, I mean, I did, whoops, I did notice coming, uh, John's going to speak about an ICAPAL, um, 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 a company that, uh, that produced all sorts of products, acoustic and otherwise. ICAPAL designed a system called Bridge Stop, which meant you can drop stuff in cavities, but it won't have an acoustic negative effect. So innovation uh, evolves from us knowing how the performance um, you know, has failed, what went wrong, telling the builder, and having the supply chain work out how to sort things out. So we're quite pleased with that. So I've just got a couple of uh, conclusion slides, if I may, then, John. Uh, I've kind of rushed through that, so if you want to know more, please uh, send me an email, give me a call. Um, we're kind of uh, looking back on how this has worked. We've got our own stats on it, but government uh, DEFRA commissioned a report to see what the, uh, uh, what the effects of this party change was. And, uh, and they've looked at it and drawn some very good conclusions where uh, failures uh, that, that were occurring on the old party have now been put right to, to the tune of some, what's that, over 300,000 dwellings. In, in that period, 2003 to 2010, those dwellings complied with Part E and the expectation was they wouldn't have done under the old regime. The best one, uh, from my point of view, is a, a recent NHBC Foundation report. Who would just say, yeah, things are getting better since 2004, yeah, we, we can measure things that have, uh, have become, uh, you know, not such a problem for us, claims-wise and, and whatever. Uh, the interesting one, the same report says, uh, and, and you need to think about this, owners of detached homes are now more likely to contact NHBC than those living in attached homes. So now the standards that we apply to attached homes means people who live in there are more content with sound insulation than people who live in detached homes who don't have any attached neighbours. I'd say you need to think about it, because I think, well, that's great, that's the job done, isn't it? If you could build a terrace house where the occupants are happier than they would be if they lived in a detached house, that's quite a result. That's what I think, anyway. Anyhow... My last slide then. Please uh, go to the website um, if, you, if you want to know more about this, because most of it can be found. I think it's a pretty easily navig navigable website. We've got a technical department. Uh, send them an email. That's what we employ them for. As you can see, they're, they're waiting there for your call. Give us a bell. So on that, I hope I've done it on time, John. Perfect. Uh, that finishes my presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks.